A handful of NRL players and coaches have been caught breaking the strict biosecurity bubble. So what does that mean for our great game? Let's dive inside the NRL. With coronavirus cases rising, recklessness could ruin it. For the game, the panel have their say. Former Storm Maroons and Australian fullback Billy Slater joins us ahead of another Roosters Storm blockbuster. Ivan Cleary handed a breach notice and fined for his comments on officials following Penrith's eighth straight victory. But was the punishment fair? Yeah, well, it's quickly becoming a quite expensive season for the Clearies. We'll get to that very shortly. And to our local and international audiences, thank you for tuning in to Inside the NRL. We love seeing all the comments pop up on Facebook, where you're watching from. But Michael and Jamie, biggest like out of the round. Oh, it's hard not to like the feel of the Penrith Panthers at the moment. That first 40, half, uh, 40 minutes in that first half was outstanding. And there's a little bit of a vibe out there, Penrith. I know you live out there. Is there there's something building out there, isn't there? There is. And, mate, do you know what I like the most? Wet weather football. I know we don't see it often. Oh, great. I, I guess every, every now and then I like to see a splash fest. It was good fun. Good fun. <laughs> That's OK. Well, mine was uh, the Clarence Valley success. Like, we had Anthony Don re-sign for the Titans. Nathan Brown got the gig for the Warriors. And then we saw Dane Laurie make his debut for Penrith. So they're all Clarence Value products and I'm a Grafton girl so I'll super stoked. But moving on we will stick with <laughs> Penrith and Ivan Cleary has been fined $20,000 by the NRL and handed down a breach notice. Um, if you did miss his comments after the match, here's what he said. I don't know. It felt like they were mani being managed back in the game. So I don't know. That's all I can say. I, yeah, some really really strange calls. Yeah, and this is what Andrew Abdo and Peter Volandis said in response. Just to question someone's integrity is not going to be tolerated, and that's what happened uh, during Ivan's press conference. He realistically uh, questioned the integrity of the match official. Well, we had a long uh, conversation about it, and I think he understands uh, the onus and the responsibility that comes with being in a, in a leadership position, and uh, I certainly think he's reflected on uh, the choice of his words accordingly. OK, Michael... Wayne Bennett got fined $20,000 for bringing the game into quite a dangerous position. Uh, he's been stood down, well, sorry, on COVID hold for two weeks. Ivan has also been fined $20,000. Is this fair game? Look, I think Ivan, if he had his choice of words again, he'd take him back. I don't, know, I don't think I, Wayne would do anything differently, to be honest. He obviously making a lot of excuses for what he did. I, I, look... I didn't have too much of an issue with what Ivan said. I, I think what he was, I understand what he was trying to get at. He didn't say it correctly. So the NRL have put, you know, they put the foot down and said, you can't say this. And hopefully that's the standard going forward because we've seen coaches get away with a lot more in the past. I didn't think that was up there with the, the level of sledging from coaches towards referees over the years. Premeditated for me from Ivan Cleary. This is the call uh, that he's probably talking about because it happens a couple of minutes later just here where Josh Mansell's on the ground, comes in. And he's right to question it, but it's, I think it's actually smart from Penrith. I, I don't really care about the fine because they haven't got a Cameron Smith in a big game that can go up and question the referee. They needed someone to shoot a little shot over the bow just to be able to say, hey, we might have the young kids that are leading the competition, but in the big games, we, we want the calls as well. So I think that Penrith go down there to have a little conversation before he goes in and he's going to just give a little warning shot ahead of what's going to be a deep finals run for the Penrith Panthers. So I actually think it's quite smart. And we've seen coaches do it forever and a day. Ricky Stewart's the master of it, you know. Wayne Bennett come out and say, oh, yeah, I wasn't sure about that call. And then the next week they get the next couple of calls. So I think it's very, very smart for uh, Ivan Cleary. $20,000 for Ivan Cleary, million dollar a season. I've got an idea. He should give that money to the West Tigers. The NRL should give the money to the West Tigers. Oh, let it go. Oh he should God. give the money West to the West Tigers. Tigers. Let it go. Wow, that bus man. has been gone for a <laughs> long time. But Ivan Cleary did, um, the Panthers did release a statement uh, later on this afternoon saying that Ivan would actually be submitting a formal response to the NRL breach issued. Um, and he just wanted to clarify that it was never his intention to question the integrity of the referees. He will not be commenting further on this matter until it is finalised. I guarantee that will be in every pe press conference out at Penrith this week to plays and <laughs> Ivan until somebody does get another comment out of him. Um, but I guess from that situation and, and like you mentioned, um, 
that you think it was premeditated. We did see uh, John Morris make comments that were quite damning as well. But I think the difference is from our understanding that you cannot question an official's ability to referee and officiate the game. And again, Ivan does it when his team wins. He doesn't do it after a loss where everyone can make out like it's sour grapes and the decision costs them in an important game. He does it when his team played the best half of footy arguably we've seen this year from a team in that first 40 minutes. He comes out and even I called the game for work and I was baffled by those decisions as well. So, I, look, I'm happy for the theatre and drama to continue. Yeah, it's all part of rugby league, isn't it? But another big part of rugby league is keeping our game safe. And at the moment, there has been a number of players and coaches, I guess, not taking the safety of coronavirus and these biosecurity protocols as strictly and... Um, I guess, yeah, as strictly as possible. We've seen Tavita Pangai Jr. and the Knights duo, the latest in this, but it was Wayne Bennett and Paul Vaughan who started it last week. Alan Langer um, and then Anthony Seabold, of course. Tavita Pangai Jr., Stafford Toa and Simi Sasagi. Uh, do you think that what happened in the last four days will be enough warning for players to take it seriously so this doesn't happen again? I think... I think the public are now aware of this and I think the players need to be more aware of it than they ever have been because they're going to be, they're going to be out there and the fans are going to try and get them. Let's be fair, Dinkum. There's a lot of you know, fans from other teams who think, you know what, if I see Paul Vaughan out, I'm going to snap him. If I see someone else, we're playing against that team this week, let's get him in trouble. I think the players need to be on red alert because the, the, the fans and the public <laughs> are aware that these guys aren't supposed to be doing what they're doing. And Tavita Pangai Jr. hasn't been, ha well, and the Knights Stewart haven't been handed down um, their COVID well, he'll be fine. breaches and fines. Pangai Jr. Yeah. And from my understanding, it'll be, it'll be more than Paul Vaughan. Paul Vaughan received ten thousand dollars. I think you know, Pangai Jr. is looking at a little bit more. So, do you think the players will listen? Because my understanding, from what I gather around rugby league, if we actually breached everyone who's broken the rules, then we wouldn't have a competition. So, the players are trying to get away with as much as they can. Yeah, and it's going to be interesting how it unfolds in the next couple of months as well as teams continue to you know, drop out of the eight and that boredom sort of sets in. So, look, I, I just hope that everyone's you know, put on notice now. And, and Michael's right, you know, fans have always been out to you know, take advantage of someone, whether you're out having a beer or not, yeah. at the wrong time. So I think the next couple of weeks is going to be red alert. And, and Peter Valenis would be reiterating that to his players. You know, mm. that they, the competition has done amazing to get up and running again. We just need to make sure that we're not taking advantage of that and, you know, letting them down. OK, but what about for the clubs who can't make the eight? Do they start getting a little lazy and start pushing the boundaries out of the Good bubble? Luck. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's going to be the sad thing. If, yeah. You know, I just hope that the players make the right decisions where, where possible, and coaches as well. You know, Wayne Bennett's not excused from that. So, um, going forward, as I said, you know, when teams drop out, it'll be interesting to see in and around what happens when those teams are finished and, and not playing finals because they're going to have to be responsible in what they're doing as they do every year, but they're going to have to be even on, on more high alert, as Michael just said. Thankfully, three of those teams are in Queensland where the restrictions are a little bit softer than they are in New South Wales. So they're not playing finals football by the looks of things. So at least that's a positive that they're, they're uh, up in Queensland and not following the same rules as New South Wales. Yeah, one of those teams who is second last is the Brisbane Broncos. And we talk about Anthony Seabold, Alfie Langer and of course Tavita Pangai Jr. in that COVID hold. Um, my question, has Anthony Seabold potentially coached his, coached his last game for the Broncos? I think... Well, if they go and if they go down to Canberra this week and, and put a performance in and knock out the Raiders, then the questions have to be asked about Anthony. I, I think Anthony Seabold will see out the year, and the, my gut feeling is that he won't be coached next year. That's I don't think the, Brisbane have gone this far. They're not going to pull the trigger with six weeks to go or so, whatever is left in the competition. He comes back, he'll see out the year, and there's going to be some serious questions asked in the off season. I, I, I don't think he'll survive the off-season, Anthony Seabold. Yeah, agree. And the worst thing that's going to seal that fate is if they do upset the Canberra Raiders this weekend, but also they put in a performance. You know, you, if they go down there and scrap and even lose 14-12 or something like that and you see a concerted effort and they compete on every play, that's going to be the, the final you know, nail in the coffin for Anthony Seabold, unfortunately. Uh, I agree with Michael. I don't do it very often on this show, but I think that in the <laughs> off-season, the Brisbane Broncos will conduct an internal review. They'll talk to some of their players and uh, they'll have a new coach in the off-season. I wouldn't even fresh. be talking to the players, Sowie. The players haven't the right to, to dictate who coaches that club I'll have to talk year. to some of the players about what went wrong because there's a disconnect between the coaches and the players. The players haven't helped well. the situation. I, I know they You've got to talk to the players, mate. 
Yeah, but it's You've not the players who are going to have to have this. They shouldn't have the, the, the major say in this because the players have let Anthony Seabold down too. And that's a reflection of what the relationship. I know that you're what you're saying, that he hasn't got along with the players the way he should have. But the, the players are the ones that are... They are a better football team than what they've got. If that football team... You, you line them up, that talent, anyone would line up for a lot of those players. That forward pack is as good as there is in the competition. So the fact that they are losing the players to other clubs and players... You know, Tavita Pangai Jr., the lack of regard for the Broncos going out when he, know, he knows the rules, he knows he shouldn't have been out there. So uh, to me, I don't think the players have earned the right to have any say in who coaches next year. Brisbane have to work out what sort of players, what sort of coach they need to get the best out of I the I didn't players. say they'd have any say in the coach. They need to talk about their performances as a group. And individually, you'll have to do that, whether it be with Darren Lockyer or the person that decides who's going to be the coach. You're going to have to have, review everyone. You can't just review well, one side of the Review the people who actually put the coach in. If the coach was such a bad appointment, 18 months ago, this board, this regime put Anthony Seabold in. So perhaps they're not the ones that should be making the decision on who the next coach should be. They didn't get it right the first time. We've seen Gus Gould's name thrown around with the Warriors, so maybe he needs to go up to Red Hill and help them out there. Is that a storyline for you? <laughs> no, I don't think... Uh, <laughs> uh, he won't have the time. He's, he's all he's into a busy New Zealand. Man. He's all into New Zealand, <laughs> Gus. He won't have the time. Uh, now, gents, look, another a topic that took my attention today was Ryan Pappenhausen. He did retweet uh, an AFL player, Mitch Robinson's tweet today, um, just regarding around bullying and death threats in our game. Um, and he just said that it's NRL players too. I spoke to Ryan earlier today and... He did admit that him and a, a number of players received death threats over betting and, and um, gambling. So here's what he had to say. Have you had a death threat because of it before? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, and I don't think that's a surprise to many players. I think there's majority would have probably gets swept under the carpet because you get, we don't really have a, a place to comment on it or it, uh, sort of makes you a bit of a target if you do go at it. So um, I think it's for, for the people higher up to sort of figure out and uh, crack down on that a bit harder because uh, us as players, if we say something, it usually comes to bite us in the bum, so. How do we stop the keyboard warriors and protect our players, Michael? You can't. You can't stop them on social media. And I think the players, if you're going to have social media, you accept that there are going to be idiots out there who are going to attack you. The same way you accept there are going to be people who are going to be gushing of the performances you put in. You get the positives with the negatives. I, I don't think any amount of education is going to change. An idiot has going to have a crack at someone. That's, that's, that's built in them over a bet as well. I, I don't think the players are going to get rid of that just by educating certain people. I think it's part and parcel of having social media. You either have it or you don't see it. I know social media wasn't prevalent when you were playing, mm. but I imagine you, you know what you sign up for, right, if you're going to be hopping on Twitter and Instagram and whatnot. Yeah, you do. And you can, you know, control it to a certain extent. You can block those people and understand. And that's what you try and pass on when you go out to schools, in, in school bullying and online bullying. Social media has become anywhere, anytime, anything about anyone at... Yeah, any point in their life and we need to be as a game we can try and protect the, our players but the players just need to probably accept that that's going to happen and unfortunately it does happen but every player goes through that mm -hmm. you know the, the people that do it are the, are the cowards that sit behind the, the keyboard and, and don't take it you know they think that that's funny to them they don't see the effects that it does have and especially with mental health these days it's yeah. disappointing that it still goes on but there's people out there Katie that happens all the time it's a catch-22, though, because you don't want the players not to be themselves and have this presence in social media. I remember my mum saying she could switch off from the world when you went home. You didn't have to turn on technology. Now it follows us. We work in that industry and so well, do players. You know what will happen? The players will shut the media out and they'll shut all the fans out and then all of a sudden the fans will realise how good they actually have it and the exposure that the players give them. And if that's what you want to happen, then keep sliding in the DMs and keep being abusive and saying all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Look at what Latrell Mitchell went through at the start of the year. He started outing people on social media. Mm. The support that he drove from that, from people, you know, fellow players and, and fellow non-Indigenous players getting behind that, that may be a way that you start to out people like that because at the Absolutely. moment, you know, if, you, if you're just going to, if we accept it, you're just going to have to get on with it. But I thought Latrell set a real precedence there, outing people on social media. Absolutely. Now we've got to get to our next guest, one of the best fullbacks in our game that I know I've ever watched, Billy Slater, nine commentator who's been stuck in Melbourne. Thanks for coming on Inside the NRL. Uh, pleasure, Katie. Now, um, how is everything down in Melbourne? I know you're stuck, um, I guess, in COVID times and mm. uh, in your home. 
Yeah, it's pretty tough down here in Victoria. Um, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones. I, we live just outside of Melbourne uh, on a bit of property. So, um, yeah, we can go outside. We've got a few animals and that sort of stuff to look after. But, um, yeah, some people that live in town, um, some people are living in apartments and, and locked down. So um, no work. A lot of people would be doing it financially tough. So uh, feeling for those. We're going to cut right to the chase with the storm. Your old mate, Cameron Smith, decision is looming soon. How did you know when it was time to retire, mate? And what would be your advice to Cameron? Because it's not just about Cameron, is it? With Harry Grant and Brandon Smith, there's some mm. big decisions around the Melbourne storm in the coming weeks. Yeah, there are. Uh, look, for me, firstly, Michael, I, I sort of knew that I wasn't ready re to retire after 2017. I... I had a couple of serious shoulder injuries uh, back to back and, and I missed a couple of years and um, you know, we had a pretty successful year in 2017 and I knew I wasn't ready to give it up. Um, but leading into 2018, I was pretty sure that that was going to be my last um, and I was just waiting for an opportunity or waiting for something to tell me that um, it, it wasn't the right decision. Um, so yeah, that was always going to be my last year. Just on Cameron. Um, Look, he's playing some great football. He, he's just got to decide whether he wants to go around again, whether he, he still wants to play the game. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not too sure whether this will be his last year or whether, whether he'll go around again. Um, I don't think the, the Harry Grant, Brandon Smith situation will, will come into it. Cameron Smith, he's afforded the right to, to make his own decision when he leaves this game. And... Don't worry, it'll be a huge transition for the Melbourne Storm if Cameron decides to hang up the boots. So um, it's a bit of a dilemma. Um, Harry Grant's obviously at the Tigers at the moment um, and Brandon Smith's been waiting in the wings. He's, he's apparently been told that the number, number nine jersey is his uh, post Cameron Smith, but, but Harry's put in such a great performance this year that he's thrown a bit of sp a spinner in the works. When I heard Billy Slade was on the show, I started getting nervous. The, the cold sweats broke out. I'm so happy not to see you in a Melbourne Storm jersey because I didn't have Come to do on, any video. It was, it's actually great to talk to you, Billy. Uh, I want to talk about you another Cameron. You've in the sun too, mate. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I want to talk to you about another Cameron, Cameron Munster. I think his development as a leader and maturity-wise this year, yeah. does that maybe play into the mind of the Melbourne Storm thinking, knowing that he's grabbed the team and taken that torch from Cameron Smith? Yeah, well, he certainly has from a performance level. I still think there's some growth, growth in his leadership. Um, um, he's settled down a lot off the field. He's, um, he's got a bit of a stable life off the field, and, and that's certainly reflected on the field. Uh, some of the, we, we know how brilliant Cameron Munster can be, and, and he's starting to be consistently brilliant. Um, he's obviously picked up a, uh, a knee injury on the weekend, and, and that's a recurring one, so that's going to be a bit of a problem for him. But... But he is, he's the spark in the Melbourne Storm. A lot of good things happen when he gets the football. And he's just, he's just one of the great players in our game. He's instinctive, but he can play with structure, um, some of the passing and skill, and he's so hard to tackle. So um, one, of the, one of the great players in our game and starting to, to become um, a, a real leader within that Melbourne organisation. And no cams uh, for both this weekend against yeah. the, the Roosters. A huge clash there. Um, now, in the halves, would you trial Ryan Pappenhausen in the halves or would you keep? Would you move Riley Jackson, keep Jerome Hughes in there? Yeah, look, I, I'd, I'd keep Ryan Pappenhausen at fullback. He's been doing a wonderful job back there. Um, I, look, I think Riley Jackson can do a, a, a good job. I thought Nico Hines was really good at fullback on the weekend and he can also play in the halves, but... Um, knowing Craig Bellamy, he'll he'll want a strong defender up there in the front line, and I think Riley Jacks will get the nod. Uh, I haven't got any inside information <laughs> on that, but just knowing the the coach, um, and and look, that they play with such a good structure, the Melbourne Storm, that you only have to go in there and do your job. Riley doesn't have to uh, overplay his hand; he just has to set up a little bit of structure and get a good kicking game away, defend well, and and the job's done. So, but it's going to be a great game. It always is against the. Uh, the Roosters, and we saw back in round eight, it, it went down to the wire, went into extra time, and, and a couple of a really good field goals by, by Pappenhausen and, and Luke Keary. Um, I think Flanagan hit a, uh, a conversion from the sideline to uh, put them in front. So it was, it was such a good game, and they have been great games over the last few years. Um, we all remember the 2018 grand final, although I've tried to forget it, but <laughs> um, yeah, the, the Roosters are, are such a great outfit, and these are the two dominant sides over the last decade.
Billy, uh, I'm not for one minute suggesting James Desco is under any threat to retain that New South Wales number one jersey, but Ryan Pappenhausen, is there room for him in New South Wales 17? Can, can he play a role off the bench this year, do you think? Yeah, well, he showed when he first came into first grade, he, he played that utility role off the bench, and sometimes he played as a forward in the middle of the field. Um, can handle it defensively because he's tough, but he's just a willing player. He wants to be involved, and he's so dangerous. So um, I think, although he wouldn't have liked to start his career coming off the bench for the Melbourne Storm, I think that's opened the door for, for this opportunity. And if... If Brad Fittler didn't see him do that and, and didn't have the confidence in him defending in the middle of the field, I don't think he'd be in the conversation, but he certainly is. Look, he's so dangerous. And as a Queenslander, I know how, how dangerous he will be coming on <laughs> when we've got some tied forwards and he's, he's just humming around that middle, looking for opportunities, looking, looking to put on little plays to take advantage of some tied forwards. And, um, and he'll hold his own in defence. I, I know he's a willing player and... Um, he's just got such a great attitude. He showed his maturity actually um, retweeting that tweet that you just spoke about before. Look, n not a lot of people would, would do that, but he's brought light to a situation and, and that showed the maturity in him. Billy, it's funny you say that. That was probably my next question, was just asking, um, I mean, in your time, did you cop death threats as well and the way he has dealt with it in such a mature way? Yeah, we've all copped um, some pretty awful things through social media, not through betting. Um, but, I, look, I, I turn all my contact off. So on Twitter, um, people can't link me into things that I can go in and, and, and look up myself. And, um, and you can turn your comments off, off your Instagram as well. The, the hard thing is, is players want to read it. Players want to read, you know, when they're playing well and all that sort of stuff. So... You're never going as good as they say you're going, and you're never going as bad. So you've got to you've got to level it out somewhere. Um, but it's just the day uh, it's 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 the day that we live in now, and it's unfortunately a part of young people's lives as they grow up. Um, so yeah, you, you've you've got to take it with a grain of salt. Honestly, if if someone said it to you that actually is a part of your life, you'd probably care about it. But um, people say you don't know who they are. They don't care about you. Um, so you've just got to you got to take it with a grain of salt. Billy, the top four teams: uh, Roosters, Melbourne, Power, and Penrith. If they are to play Melbourne on the big day, who's playing the best at the moment? Who? What style are you liking, analysing, and watching from week to week? Yeah, the cream are, are starting to rise to the top. Sowie, it's um, look any. any one of those four teams can win the competition. I've been really impressed with the Panthers at the moment. Um, Nathan Cleary is is playing as, as good as a halfback's playing in the competition, and he's playing the best that I've seen him play. The, the way that the game has changed with the six-to-go rule, I think it's really helped Cleary because he likes to get the ball all the time, and he's got, he's got all these soldiers out there that just want to work for the team. Um, they, they run nice and direct. They get in their lanes, they keep their width, and they rely on their halves to distribute the ball to their strike. So um, I think Trent Barrett's got a lot to, to credit for that. And it's positive signs for the Bulldogs um, that Trent Barrett's um, employed this, this style at the foot of the mountains. And yeah, I think if they can keep it up and they can keep a healthy roster, there's no reason why they can't win the competition. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, Billy, when will we see you back commentating for Channel 9? Is there potential this year or you think it's crossed out? <sighs> yeah, it's not looking good, Katie. Mm. Um, look, I, I suppose things would have to um, get brighter down here in Victoria before I'd be allowed to cross the borders. Um, yeah, so, look, it is it is what it is. Um, look, if, if you know, people are dying. So, yeah. unfortunately, it's, it's a pretty grim situation down here and Hopefully we can just get this this virus under control in our state. And um, look, I, I did hear that there was you know the speculation about the AFL Grand Final moving to a different state and all that sort of stuff. I really hope it's done with a lot of respect because um, you don't want to be taking advantage of Victoria right now. And I think as a country we we really need to be pulling together and and respecting each other and helping each other out. Yeah, health is certainly number one. I, we really appreciate your time and make sure you and your family stay safe. I did just notice that horse uh, drawing in the background. I'm sure that's from your wife, Nicole. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, you don't think so it's please mine. pass on that message. <laughs> <laughs> it looks fantastic. <laughs> but uh, thanks so much Will for do. your time, Billy, and yeah, stay safe with the fam. <laughs> yeah, thanks, guys. See you later.
Billy Slater there. And make sure you tune in on Thursday night for that blockbuster, The Storm and the Roosters, live on Channel 9. It is now time for Sweet or Sour. Jamie? Can I have two Sweet or Sours? Yeah, go for it. That's pretty cool, talking footy with Billy Slater. Like, yeah. For me, yeah, like, seriously, <laughs> I'm legend, playing against him, but talking <laughs> footy is something in post-retirement that I love doing with former players and to talk footy with him. Uh, but uh, another Sweet or Sour this week, it's Sweet. The Titans. Ash Taylor. So friendly. He smiled on the weekend and I just love it just reminded me of you know, how good this kid can be. I thought he was outstanding on the weekend. They're up and about at the moment, the Titans. They're competing for every play. Justin Holbrook's bottled something up there for me that they can really benefit off another preseason. But that smile there is is why we play the game. And Ash has been through a really tough time off field and on field with his some of his performances. And I've questioned, you know, whether he's the right man to get them through. But when I see him play like that with that I guess, happiness for the game, that makes me really, really happy. So I enjoyed that on the weekend. Yeah, that smile is so big. I feel like I haven't seen that smile on him for a long time. It's good to it's see. It's infectious. And yeah. his team, they get those forwards next year. And he's the big question mark. If he can deliver how we all know he can, you know, they're, they're a potential top eight team next year. Yeah, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. All right, you gents need to get over to the touch screen for another insightful meet. And while you're doing that, it's time now for the Casualty Ward, brought to you by Go Healthy Vitamins. <laughs> Unfortunately for Manly, Adam Fanua Blake is set to miss a month of footy after a high grade PCL injury. Marty Tapao will have to pass HIA protocol after he failed to return, suffering a head knock. Cameron Munster faces a second stretch on the sideline after doing the same medial ligament injury that kept him out for two weeks earlier this season. Billy Walters has played his last game for 2020. The West Tigers confirmed a dreaded ACL and MCL for the 26 year old. While Canberra are hopeful, Sevilla Havili will play against Brisbane on Saturday despite a tricep injury. In other casualty ward updates, a hip pointer injury shouldn't keep Jake Avarillo out of their clash against the Tigers on Sunday. As for West Tigers, we could see Jacob Little line up. The club confirmed he is fit to play after suffering an ACL injury last year, but it's unclear if Michael Maguire will name the hooker. And finally, some good news for the Roosters. Josh Morris and Jared Warrior Hargreaves are expected to make their return this week, recovering from their respective calf injuries. That's this week's Casualty Ward brought to you by Go Healthy Vitamins. Now, Jamie and Michael, you're back on the touch screen and looking at halves and their vision today. Yeah, Katie, specifically Sean Johnson and Lachlan Lewis. Sally, what did you see on the weekend that highlights the difference between them? Well, I just saw Lachlan Lewis who throws an intercept to Josh out of a car, but the difference between a rookie half who's still cutting his teeth in the NRL and a veteran. If we go to the touch screen, you see Lachlan Lewis who's at second receiver. He's trying to get to the outside of this up and in defence of the Melbourne Storm. As play unfolds, he digs right into the line, but just here, his vision is all into this part of the Melbourne Storm. He's just looking there. He hasn't looked to see where Josh Adokar, who's going to come up into this lane and take the intercept, is. And by the time he swings his head around, throws the ball, he throws the intercept to Josh Adokar. Now, the up and in Melbourne Storm defence, you can see there, it's too late by the time you swivel your head versus what we're about to see with Sean Johnson. So what does Sean Johnson do differently to actually get the try with Ronaldo Bolotalo? Well, what I've liked from Sean Johnson's game, especially yesterday, was his patience to be able to come up with the right play. He knew when to kick in behind the line and he also knew when to come up with the right play to pass. Again, you see Sean Johnson at first receiver here going to the line. He's, he's been kicking it all afternoon, so he knows that he's got Mike Acevo on the back foot. Goes to the line here and just as you pause there, his vision is all about in here. He's got Mike Acevo looking in, who's lost his wing over here, which is Ronaldo Mulitalo, and then all of a sudden he gets him with the eyes and scores the try. Great hands from Mulitalo, but this shot right here will show Sean Johnson's eyes. That's 45. That's what you didn't see with Lachlan Lewis. Lachlan Lewis was looking in, swivels ahead really quickly, whereas Sean Johnson's vision was at 45. Comes up with a great play. Perfect game from Sean Johnson yesterday. I know they didn't get the win, but that's the most in control of his game he's been in a long time. Well, there you have it, Katie. We love Sean Johnson here and he's showing why. Absolutely. I feel like I'm learning something week in, week out as well. I'm sure the audience is too. Thanks, gents. Coming up, hit or miss. But before we get there, it's time to, I guess, give a bit of recognition to our unsung heroes, those in the community, the volunteers, and of course, all the grassroots footy clubs. We do get caught up in the daily news. But it is time to honour those with the community awards. Let's take a look at the last year's winners. What the football club was for our community was the, the knitting together that allowed us to, to come together as a community and work together. Being up here in the Gulf, we always had ties with the other communities, but um, 
getting the boys in and the girls in to play rugby league and it, it's um, just brought everyone together stronger and uh, it's not one club over there and one over there, we're all just one big family. I love it. And like you saw on the screen, you can cast your vote, playrugbyleague.com forward slash community ward. So make sure you get your votes in there. It's now time for Hit or Miss. All right. James Tedesco is still the game's best player. Uh, I made the mistake of... <laughs> I made the mistake a few weeks back of saying that maybe Tom Trebojevic was coming for him if he hadn't got it. I made yeah, and you jinxed him. I love Tommy, but, yeah, I did jinx him. James Tedesco, it's, it shouldn't even uh, be in there because we're both going to say hit. We want to argue. It's a hit for me. Yeah, look, there's talk around yeah, Luke Keary and obviously Nathan Cleary and what they're doing. They're playing fantastic at the moment. But this guy, for me, if you have one or two bad weeks, doesn't mean you're still not the best player in the world. And I think Thursday night you will see James Tedesco light up the SCG. He is the best player in the world. We had Billy on earlier, and I never thought we'd see anyone better than Billy, right? Will he go close? <clears throat> it, it, well, it depends how you, you count it up. If you're going to talk championships, if you're going to talk, you know, Billy Slater changed. Just impact on the game. Is, is it, no. it, will he be in the same category as Billy Slater by the end of his career? Uh, he plays the game how he plays it now because of Billy Slater. Mm. I think that Billy Slater's a... He's the pioneer. Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, when he he changed the way fullbacks caught the ball, played out the back, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, What if the game changes again for the number one and he's still around? Okay. Could you see the fullback position change? It's hit or miss, not hit or miss as many times as I want. <laughs> Keep going. Yes. How's this? You can't oh change my gosh. the narrative. Michael uh. Chalmers telling me what to do. Stop it. <laughs> Sit in your chair. All right. Nathan Brown will take the Warriors to top eight. Finals contention in his coaching tenure at the Warriors. Hit or miss? Oh, that's a tough one. I'm going to say hit. I think they've they've gotten they've gotten more out of this year than the five teams below them, which is the Dragons, Cowboys, Titans. Bulldogs and Broncos. That that's coming over here and setting up base and, and wanting and, and winning and all that kind of stuff. That's Nathan Brown goes over there now and that core cool group that he decides to keep on contract and all that kind of stuff, they're already in front of where they should have been. So I think yes, I think that they've really shown something this year. Yeah, the Warriors had every right once their Stephen Kearney was sacked, the players were filthy the way it all happened. They had every right to, to give up this season. Of course was they over. Did. And they haven't. And to me, that's probably part of the reason why Nathan Brown's interested because there's fight in the Warriors that gives you hope that, you know what, they can make the finals. Eli Katoa's a good player. They've got young guys coming through. With Roger there, I just think the halves. If, if Chanel and Cody Nicarima can gel, then there's some, there's some positive signs around them if they can add a couple of uh, big signings. That's a poor reflection on the bottom five teams below the Warriors. That's really, really poor. Mm. We'll like get to on, those. On, yeah, we'll get really to those. Poor. I don't want to get you started too early. OK, Stephen Crichton is the new rookie favourite for the 2020 season. Hit or miss? I'm going to go miss at this point. I'm going to say Harry Grant probably still deserves to be Rookie of the Year. Uh, but Stephen Crichton, he'll probably end up a better player than most of the guys coming through this rookie class. I just, it's amazing what he's been able to do and the impact he's had at such a young age for the Penrith Panthers. Uh, it reminds me of a young Israel Folau, the way he's playing. Uh, I, I think he'll go close, and if the Panthers make a good run towards the finals and they go, you know, Harry Grant's injured now, he'll go close. But at this stage, for me, Harry Grant's the front runner. Yeah, miss for me. Harry Grant had the West Tigers trekking and making the eight, and without him, they look lost. Um, I know he's only on loan, but Stephen Crichton's a fantastic player and, and his finishing's you know, second to none at the moment, but mm. he's, there's a lot of good people inside him doing a lot of good work before he gets those opportunities where Harry Grant was creating those opportunities. And you look at what the West Tigers are without him, they're, they're not very good. Mm. Big <laughs> statement uh, about comparisons to Israel Folau. Yeah, you shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do that. Okay. okay. No. Sorry, allowed, now I've got you in trouble. You're allowed <laughs> Stephen Crichton to be Stephen Crichton. Okay, thanks for the advice. Next, <laughs> next question. Oh gosh. The top eight is signed, sealed and delivered. Let's take a look at the top eight before I get your answers here. Uh, well, sorry, that's a race for the eight. These are the, this is the run the home for these bench. teams. Yes. Um, the Rabbitohs have a, a bit of a tough one there with, with Parramatta. Manly might get a couple of troops back. Melbourne, Roosters. The Sharks, I think, uh, they're, they've got their fate in their own hands. I think it is set. I, I can't see anything from Manly, what I saw on the weekend. Like, if they lose again this weekend and, and the Sharks win, which they 
most likely will. It's. it's I, think Man, I think Manly. I think Manly sneak in. Tigers, Bulldogs, Titans, Warriors. In the four weeks, they expect Tom Trebojevic back. They'll, they'll win four in a row to finish the okay. season. If they can stay within striking distance, okay. I think the Warriors can pip the Rabbitohs. I think Man the Sharks will get Manly in. Manly got out in Thurs two weeks in a row at Brookvale. That doesn't happen if they're going to make the eight. The Tom Trebojevic just takes him to a whole nother. Hold on. Takes him to another. The level. Warriors out in Thurs Manly at Brookvale. Let that yeah. sink in. Yeah, a team that's borrowing players out enthused, a team that's fighting. You're not hearing me. Tom Trebojevic doesn't play, they don't even get another win. But I'm just. Adam Fanua Blake is injured. Marty Tapao has to pass a HIA test. They, they just haven't got Dylan Walkers out. They just haven't got the depth to be able to cover those positions. I know how important Tom Trebojevic is, but the other guys lay that foundation so that he and DCE can work together. So am I allowed to say miss or do you have to answer it for me? I said miss. There I miss. That's hit. That's oh. the eight. <laughs> what about a fairy tale for the Warriors? Just to throw fairy tale for the Warriors would be very impressive, but I think they just fall short. Yeah, fairy tale would be good, but no, not, not, this, not this year. Okay, no worries. Let's go to your power rankings, Jamie. This week's NRL Power Rankings see the Parramatta Reels drop down one spot to number four. I just think out of the big four that they are probably ranked for in terms of competing for a championship. I'm worried about some of their defence because the last couple of weeks they've had big leads and they've just let the teams back into it. Yeah, they're finding ways to win, but the positive for Brad Arthur would be the fact that they are doing this two months out from the finals, not two or three weeks out from the finals. So they've got time to correct things and get through this little lull and fire up as they head towards the finals. Dylan Brown's been sensational, especially with Mitchell Moses coming back into the side. It's important if they are to win the title this year, that his development continues to take control of the team in case Moses is handled in one of those big occasions. Yeah, uh, mate, the, the New South Wales half, Cleary, Keary, Moses, they're all playing really well, good football at the moment. Let's see who wins the comp. The Gold Coast Titans, for me, have the brightest prospects in Queensland going forward, and they show that on the weekend. They make a climb up the power ranking. AJ Brimson, I didn't expect this coming back. I saw what he did against the Roosters, and whilst I was impressed, I probably need a little bit more out of him. He certainly did a little bit on the weekend. I think the Titans are on the way to making the eight next year. Tino coming, David Fafida, AJ Brimson playing well. I think they're the makings of a good football team. I was critical of the Titans, but, mate, they'll be sliding up that power rankings next year, I can tell you that, mate. If they can keep their standards and consistency, Justin Holbrook will see out this plan here. You can see that they've changed the way they think about their footy now and they're actually getting the results for it. One team that's struggling at the moment is the Manly Seagulls. They've been depleted by injury, but, again, their style of footy, urgency and want in the games that matter most just haven't shown up. Yeah, without Tom Trebojevic, there's real concerns and question marks over Manly's credentials. They, they can't get Tommy back quick enough, and the injuries keep mounting for the Seagulls at the moment. I don't know. They'll scrape into the eight. So I just don't know how much of an impact they'll have in September. No Adam Fanua Blake, no Marty Tapao on the weekend hurt them, but I think that that's, that's the last bell for the Manly Seagulls. I don't think that they'll make the eight from here. So make sure you keep an eye out every Monday at midday for the NRL Power Rankings. Thank you for that. As always, Jamie, it's now time for Champ or Chump, and we're a little light on this week, but we do have a goodie. Jason Demetrio and his dance moves after, of course, South beat the Broncos. He was asked to show them off, and we do remember Wayne Bennett's. Here's what he had to show off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's going to have to work on that. Am I right? Yeah. Chump. Chump. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, Jason. Not, not his best. <laughs> <laughs> he, you can tell he felt embarrassed. At least he had to go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give him a, a chant for that. Well, they won. That's the main. Yeah. Well, it's a rookie coach. He did what he was asked there. Wayne Bennett would have just given a boost, mate. He wouldn't. Have done yeah. it. He would have waited until the dressing room and he would have been dead. You haven't jumped or jumped? Uh. Jump. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, don't forget, NRL teams is here tomorrow. Zach Bailey, Brett Kamali and Robbie Farah from 355 to bring you all the latest on the 16 NRL teams and their lineups for round 14. And that basically brings us to the end of the show, gents. Shout outs. Shout out to our number one fan, actually, my little boy, four year old Ollie's at home with tonsillitis, struggling at the moment. Ollie, I know you're watching. I'll be home soon, mate. Get the dinner ready for me. Oh, what's he cooking? <laughs> Whatever. Eggs. <laughs> what about for you, Jack? My shout outs to Ollie. I know it means a little bit more, mate, from a Dragons fan. Uh, so <laughs> hope you get better soon, buddy. <laughs> we love you, Ollie. Thanks for tuning in. I've also got Elaine Nolan. I know you're watching. I think she's actually, arguably, probably the number one fan. She gave me Panadol when I broke my nose, so thanks for that. 
Also, Emily and Joe, love yous. That's it. That, that's okay, enough? Great. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Until next Monday, have a good one. The hitch at the